What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton, and welcome to episode one of the Power Company Climbing podcast, brought to you by powercompanyclimbing.com. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we build climbing training programs uh, for specific types of climbers. Uh, we don't believe in a one-size-fits-all approach to training, and frankly, neither should you. So come check us out. You can also find us on Facebook, and you can find us on Instagram at Power Company Climbing. Uh, and all those are different feeds, different content, uh, so make sure you check us out on all those platforms. Okay, I am on the road right now in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, where I'm trying to get some bouldering done in between all the bursts of torrential rain that the southeast has been having. There's a pretty much a flood watch every day, and somehow the boulders dry up in between those, so uh, I'm not going to complain. Actually getting some work done here. Um, some of you may know that I had a shoulder surgery back in April uh, to repair a fully torn labrum, fully torn rotator, partially torn and shredded bicep tendon. Uh, so it was a pretty major rebuild. And uh, I had a great physical therapist, uh, my friend Tammy, who's also a climber, and uh, I got cleared to climb in September. Uh, and maybe sport climbing would be the safe choice here, but uh, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not psyched on sport climbing right now, so I'm trying to boulder. And even though I'm not full strength in the right arm and my right shoulder, I'm back to uh, pretty consistent around the V7 level, which is, isn't too shabby for me, being that I'm mostly an old, weak guy sport climber. Uh, but I'm learning. I'm trying to learn. Episode 1. Shit, this thing got off the ground. I'm going to do a little celebration dance. You probably should too, because uh, I can't promise there's going to be an episode two. I'm sure as hell going to try, but no promises. All right, our guest today for episode one is Carlo Traversi, uh, a climber from Santa Rosa, California, who most of you know as one of America's strongest boulders, uh, one of the world's strongest boulders for that matter. Uh, but he also clipped some bolts. He's climbed some ridiculously hard sport climbs. And he was a sport climbing national champion in 2009. So get your facts straight. He's not a one-trick pony. Uh, I talked with Carlo in uh, Lander, Wyoming this past summer during the International Climbers Festival. And we talked largely about uh, the importance of being dynamic in your climbing and the importance of creating momentum and how to use that momentum and uh, how to look at climbs with a, a, a new approach. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about once we get going here. Um, so, yeah, without further ado. If I can leave with anything, it's just get a little wild with it, you know? Okay, so I'm sitting here in lovely and sunny Lander, Wyoming with Carlo Traversi, who just got back from South Africa and an impressive ascent of sky, which for me, I'm not a boulder necessarily. I love to boulder, but I just don't get to do it very often. But when I think of like the pure, powerful, archetypal boulder, uh, definitely the thing that comes into my head is sky. It just looks like this pure, amazing power problem. Absolutely. Uh, is there going to be a video of your ascent? Yeah, I have now? video of the, the send. Yeah. Actually, we didn't even shoot it super well. We, uh, uh, It's just, just the send footage, basically. There's like a bunch of people around, and awesome. it was just a very random moment. Well, so. Jamie Emerson would be proud that it's, <laughs> yeah, uncut, it's uncut footage. So I'm the best at the uncut footage, that's for <laughs> sure. I got it all on... All on the archives, that's for sure. So Well, cool. And tell me a little bit about that ascent, because I think I read that you had to switch up the normal beta and just go even more dynamic than the problem requires of everyone else. Yeah, I did. Actually, um, I was there in South Africa three years ago, and I tried Sky the normal way, which is this really, really big reach to a blind edge, um, maybe like a f half pad to full pad in cut edge. Um, it's only really good for one hand. Um, and most people just do this huge extended reach off this flat jug 
out to this edge. And right. it's just, I can physically reach it if someone boosts me up into it, but it's at a point where my shoulders pretty much unlock like yeah. slightly. Uh-huh. Um, and I just don't have that. I mean, I'm not like a gymnast or anything like that. I can't hold a, I can't hold an iron cross. So right. um, <laughs> I'm still not sure how Daniel managed to pull off the first ascent like that. Cause we're, we're not that different in height. He has a little more reach than I do, yeah, but he's got long, he's arms. got long arms. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's still <laughs> impressive from, from his standpoint. But, um, it that's, was, that's his problem. Right? That's his he, problem. He, he put it up. Yeah. It's very impressive for sure. Very impressed by that one. Um, but when I tried it then three years ago, it felt just absolutely impossible for me. And it was kind of a bummer because it's such a beautiful line and I have a hard time accepting that things are not going to be possible for me. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, I'm really, quality. I'm really stubborn about that, but that was one of the problems that was, I was like, man, I may never do this thing. I really like, there are a few problems that hit me that way. And that one, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever do sky. Like this is kind of a bummer. Um, but actually I saw a video of Alex Magos last year doing the dyno, um, way he, he dynoed from basically the start holds and his dyno was a, a little bit different than what I did. Um, mm-hmm. He basically jumps out and grabs it one-handed. He kind of like, it's, it's more of like a reach right. to stick it. And yep. then he comes in with the other hand, like pretty much immediately. Right. Um, it's less of like a full-on dyno, at least the way it looks. Um, and then I tried it his way this year just because it, I was curious if that was going to work for me. Um, and starting on the start holds, it's kind of like a sideways move. And I could kind of see what he was doing, but I couldn't quite dial it in that way mm-hmm. um, until I actually moved lower than the start holds for Sky. So Sky starts on like this giant rail feature. It's like a big jug. So I went further down on the rail to the right oh, okay. and it set me up under the, under the crimp basically straight on rather than being from the side. But it was also like another foot and a half further. Wow. So it was a way bigger dyno and I was starting lower, about a foot and a half lower than the start holds on the rail. But for me, it was a much bigger jump, but it was easier to coordinate because I was dealing with just a straight on jump rather than a sideways jump. So the swing was a little bit easier to control. Yeah. And it was felt really improbable to me, but, um, you know, I think you give it enough tries, you have a few moments where you feel like you're going to do it. And, um, I lined it up one time. Yeah. <laughs> luckily I, I didn't fall on the top. <laughs> I think it's pretty impressive that you were able to, you know, even though the beginning of, of your, your issue with sky was that it was this huge move and then your thought process eventually led you into, Oh, let's make the move even bigger. Yeah. Just because it's more, con- I can control it better and I can move through space better going this direction. You know, I think that, that leads me to, you know, basically what I want to talk to you about today is just being a dynamic climber. Because if anyone who's watched you climb knows that you're extremely powerful yeah, and, and that you aren't afraid to be dynamic. And, oh, yeah. and I think a lot of people, especially uh, definitely people I work with, and I think I see it fairly often, have trouble just unleashing, you know, yeah. and letting themselves be dynamic. Um, so I think it's really impressive that you can, you know, just say, oh, I need to be even more dynamic. I need to go even bigger. Thanks, man. Just so I can make this move more my style. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting understanding of movement and you have to really start breaking things down in terms of why you're failing because the failure for me wasn't my ability to get to the hold. And I felt like I could still jump further from the side. Um, and so I started looking at the range of possibility as to why I was failing on the move. And I felt like the sideways jump was causing me to fail more often than if I was coming straight on. So I started looking outside the box and hmm. it was, it was actually kind of a funny moment when I realized that I was going to do sky actually from lower holds, which is funny because my trouble was reach to the hold. Yeah. And now I'm going to go pick lower holds and make the problem possible, which is really strange, but you kind of have to think outside the box in that way when you're dealt with a problem that is very different from what anyone else is going to, it felt like a first ascent to me in a lot of ways. Yeah, for and sure. it kind of was because no one's really done the move exactly like that. Yeah. Um, and and so it was, an, it was a special problem to me in that way because I was dealing with something that no one else had really ever dealt with on it. Um, and that made it a really cool experience. Um, it made it more like a first ascent experience than, than anything else, which, which is really fun to deal with. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So you told me earlier um, when we were talking at breakfast that, that you've done you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 clinics in the last year. Um, teaching people to climb. Last few years, yeah. Yeah, And one of the things that you run into are people having trouble being dynamic. Yeah. 
Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how you break that down and, and try to get people to just unlock that dynamic yeah. potential. Yeah. You know, I've seen, I've seen kind of both issues, either people, typically if people are more interested in bouldering, they're going to be slightly more dynamic climbers than, yeah. than what a sport climber would be. Yep. But what I've also seen with those climbers is that while they may be dynamic and they may be good at being dynamic, like they can get themselves to jump and move quickly between holds, um, they're not in very good control of it. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge difference between being dynamic, but also being in control of what you're doing dynamically. Because dynamic movement, while it may seem like wild and crazy, is actually an extremely controlled, precise movement. Yeah, definitely. There's never anything wild going on about it. You know exactly how your body's going to move, how it's going to react. And you have to have that understanding or else you're really, unless you're jumping jug to jug, you're not going to be able to control what, what's going on. So, right. Um, but then you're dealing with sport climbers as well who, who really don't have that built into them. They're used to holds being closer together, holds being maybe not as good. So things are harder to go dynamic to them. So you want to be very controlled. You want to be yep. very slow. You're trying to conserve energy throughout a route. Um, and those people will want to break into more bouldering movement or they'll find a sport route that um, has dynamic movement on it, has a bouldery section that they're forced to get dynamic. Yep. Um, and I've, I guess I've taught a lot of people that have had both sides of that spectrum, whether they're dynamic, they don't know how to really control how their dynamic movement is, or you have people that are, you know, sport climbers or, you know, people that are typically just more, um, of a static climber. Um, yeah, and that was definitely me. Static. I, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Starting as a track climber, uh, for years and then becoming a sport climber, my, yeah my uh, style was very sloth-like, you know, yeah. super controlled, super slow, very static. And it's good to have that because I think a lot of people that are it dyna is. like dynamic to start don't know how to be like that. Right. And I think it's important to have all of those. Yeah, have both tricks in your both bag. Both tricks you know? in the bag. You need to be able to, to know when to be dynamic and when you need to, you know, harness that energy and then also when to slow things down. And, and there's a rhythm to climbing, you know, and you have to understand – that every route, every problem, every experience in climbing out there has a different rhythm to it. And the faster you can understand that rhythm, the better climbing will be and the faster you'll get things done. Yeah. So is there, say you encounter a guy who is like I used to be and hated jumping, Yeah. you know, just thought, oh, I can do a giant lock off and get through it and that's going to yep. be better for me. Um, say you encounter that at one of your clinics, uh, where do you start him in trying to get him to loosen up a little yeah i mean i start <laughs> it's it's i've i've had a few different techniques um uh off the top of my head um some things work some things are different for different people um there's kind of a variety of things but but like you said i mean loosening up really is the key to it um and typically what i'll start off with people is making sure that they're warmed up and then actually just shaking out like literally just sit there yeah, and just, just getting shake their the arms out, yeah. just like getting wild, you know what I mean? Yep. Feeling out of control. Yep. You know, if you're used to feeling like very tight and cord yep. up, you know, like yep. you need to just loosen everything up. Yeah, Start don't feeling be a robot. the motion of climbing. <laughs> Start moving around a lot, feeling the momentum. Um, and then we'll get on the wall and I'll... I'll typically put them on jug to jug dinos and just start. Or if people can't really even dyno, just doing double hand um, jumps between holds, even mm, if it's mm -hmm. only a couple feet or even right, less. Sure. Um, so you're just taking it in baby steps. Um, the other thing that's really good for this is uh, one arm traversing um, because you're forced to like pull and catch and pull and catch. Yeah, for sure. And just getting used to the motion of like pulling with one arm or, or really just kind of snap motions and then catching holds is really all that dynamic movement is, whether it's a dead point or a dyno or, or whatever we're talking about. So just starting at the smallest, easiest possible step mm -hmm. and just getting comfortable with that and then slowly building off of that is the best way to go. Yeah, um, I think that one arm technique is pretty important. You know, I've done, yeah. because I've had this shoulder injury for a while, I've done a very small amount of just one arm climbing just to kind of satisfy my need to yeah. to climb. And, and it definitely reminds me when I do that how to get my weight over my feet and then use that weight to propel yeah. me, you know, and, and I think that's something especially guys tend to forget because we can just pull in with our arms yeah. and, and move with our upper bodies. 
And and when you can't do that, when you have to go dynamically between holds because you have no other choice, you really have to find a way to get your weight over your feet. No Absolutely. matter how steep the wall is, you still have to yeah. propel yourself that way. Absolutely. And and that's that's a big thing in understanding dynamic movement is that people think that when they're dynoing that they need to be strong in the arms necessarily. Right. And while being strong in the arms matters, it's not the most important aspect of dynoing. Your arms are more for aligning your weight above your feet and then using your feet to generate you upwards. So there's very little dynoing that comes out of the arms. The arms are more just like putting you in the right position a lot of the times. Right. Um, and so finding the correct feet for dinos becomes a big, big thing. You know, if you're jumping off really low feet, you're only going to get so far. As you find smaller feet that are a little higher, you're going to find it a lot easier to get stuff done. Yeah. So. And in that same respect, I find that a lot of the people who I work with who aren't good at dynamic climbing, um, they tend to not understand the path of movement that your body takes. And I think that yeah. path is really important. And that goes back to your experience with Sky. Yeah. In that, yeah, the move became bigger, but your path through the air was was much better for you and made the, the end result easier to control. Yeah. And I find that a lot of people try to kind of hug the wall when they throw on a steep wall, they just yeah. don't understand it. They they imagine it as if it were just a vertical wall tipped steeper, and um, and your path has to be considerably different. You know, you have to yep. you have to create momentum upwards instead of straight out in the same angle as the yeah. wall. Yeah, and and another way of um, forcing a little bit more dynamic movement in your climbing is, um, and this isn't necessarily just for dinos, but it's just being a more dynamic climber is um, forcing yourself to use higher feet, um, mm -hmm. uncomfortably high feet at times. Because when you have really high feet, it's pushing your whole body away from the wall. So you're right. having to, to to negotiate those feet and pull yourself in dynamically to get to the next hold. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of force yourself to use those higher feet, you're going to have to use more dynamic movement usually to get to holds. And that's not a technique that you want to use for everything. But sure. if, if you're using it in order to get yourself to be more dynamic, then it can be really effective, I think. Right, a good teaching tool, a good exactly. way to force yourself into learning something. Yeah. Yeah, another thing I use, um, particularly with girls, I don't find this as much with guys, mm -hmm. though I do see it sometimes, is that a, a lot of girls tend to want to have both feet on yeah. for every move, you know, and and they have a hard time just creating momentum off of one the foot. One leg, yeah. Even if it's not a dyno, they still have to use some momentum in their climbing and and they're always looking for that second foot and they'll sometimes put it on a position that makes them off balance and makes yeah. the move even harder so what i have them do a lot of times is during their warm-ups just do problems with one foot and then do the problem again with the other foot yeah and it forces them to learn how to create momentum out of awkward positions yep. and all of a sudden they're being dynamic because they have to be yeah you know and after several sessions of that they get they get more and more accustomed to, to being dynamic. Yeah. Uh, was there a point in your climbing where you were not dynamic? Did you start out just always being a dynamic climber? Yeah. I, I mean, I was really short, even shorter than I was now when I started climbing. How um, tall are you? I'm five foot seven. Okay. So, or like just about five foot seven. <laughs> I'm pretty short. Uh, I have like a plus three to four ape index though. So I have okay. a decent so size. So you've got arms those span. ape arms. Yeah. Too I got a little bit longer. Daniel's long, got a yeah. little bit longer arms for sure. Um, but yeah, I've always been more of a dynamic climber. I, I've enjoyed dynoing from when I started climbing and whatnot. So it's, I guess that's why it's been hard, like hard in some ways for me to teach dynamic climbing because I don't know what it was like before that. Right. Um, I didn't have that experience. So I can't, I can't relate as well as someone that has maybe gone through the process of learning how to be a more dynamic climber. Mm -hmm. but, um, so most of my time spent teaching that has been trying to understand what people feel like as a more static climber and what's holding them back in terms of being more dynamic. Cause I've never had those boundaries on myself. I've always sure. felt like I can just go as hard as my body will, you know, let me basically. Yeah. One thing I think is interesting. You talking about, um, you know, just, just moving yourself dynamically and, and it coming you know, fairly easy to you that that's just something you needed to do and it, and it worked for you. Um, a technique that I try to teach a lot of the people I work with is one that I just automatically connect to you. I've seen it, I've seen it before, 
You yeah. know, I think it was originally called the moon kick or something. Yeah, yeah. And, the pogo. and you guys <laughs> popularized the term pogo. As yeah. far as I know, I mean, that's who I definitely equate it to. Yeah. Uh, you and the Louder Than Eleven crew. Yeah. The videos. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I definitely teach a lot of the shorter climbers that I that I work with that's awesome. how to pogo. And it goes back to that one foot warm up stuff. You know, it once is. they've mastered that, they can really start to create more momentum. Yeah. Uh, is that a technique you use pretty often in, in the real world that's in climbing? One of the biggest techniques that I use in my climbing. Yeah. Um, and I, it's actually, it got to the point where I wasn't doing moves unless I was pogoing almost. Like nice. it was strange. I like took it so far that I was actually hindering my climbing in some ways because I wasn't, I wasn't doing moves the easiest way because pogoing felt so natural to me. Yeah. Um, and so this was maybe three or four years ago that I realized this because I remember I did a comp and I think Stephen Jeffrey told me afterwards, he's like, dude, what the hell are you pogoing that move for? It's way easier to do it the other way. And I like, I went back and I was like, shit, man. I'm like, everything I do is like semi a pogo. And I was like, I need to, and it was kind of like always just jumping between things. Mm -hmm. So I had to reassess what I was doing and, um, and make sure that, when I was pogoing, it was for a reason. Um, it was for a specific purpose and not just doing it just because I felt comfortable that way. But I think that because I took so much time in, in being more comfortable with pogoing, that now I can use it very, very easily on pretty much anything. Yeah. Um, and I had that experience in Rocklands. Um, there's this problem called uh, quintessential that shut me down three years ago that I just could not figure out the jump move. And everyone's done it with just two feet on the wall. And you do this big jump to this jug and it's kind of like a windmill move. Um, and it's a really large jump move. Um, and I tried it again this year, right when I got there and I was trying it with both feet on and I just wasn't getting the distance. And then I was just like, oh, maybe I'll try pogoing it. Like, we'll see what happens. And sure enough, first try with the pogo, like I was just hmm. like, past the jug in the hole and it was easy, you yeah. know, and just having that in the, um, the repertoire of moves is I think really important, especially for a shorter climber, taller climbers, maybe don't need it as much so they don't right. need to utilize it as much but um if you're a shorter climber like having understanding the pogo and when to use it and knowing and feeling comfortable with using it can be extremely helpful in a lot of situations yeah and i think i think you hit on something there that's really important about learning any kind of new movement is uh you really have to learn it to the point of mastering it and it yeah. becoming so automatic that it's something you can just go to whenever. Yeah. And, and I think I've seen in skill development, uh, particularly in rock climbing, yeah. several cases of people working on their weakness or working on a new move and getting so good at it that they just start to use it all the time, yeah. even when it's not the best technique to use. You exactly. know, I saw, <laughs> I've talked to Angie Payne a little bit about uh, when she was first really getting into trying to jump because she's always been exactly the same kind of climber I was yeah. though much much stronger and better at little holds um but she's always been really static and yeah. she was uh learning to jump and then at a a world cup or a nationals or something she was trying this dyno over and over and over and then the people after her just did it statically <laughs> and she was like, oh, no, you know, I didn't even see it because I was so wrapped up exactly. in, in jumping. So then she had to reassess and, and exactly. figure out, okay, now I'm good at it. When do I use it? Exactly. You know? And the reassessment's important. Having perspective in who you are as a climber and, and what you – I've always had a lot of video footage of myself climbing. Um, yeah. And it's been – I've used it for obviously like commercial purposes. But sure. In a lot of ways, it's been really good for me to be able to look. I've gone and watched old videos of myself just to see how my climbing style has changed over the years. Um, and it's been really, really helpful for me to see that progression and to see what type of a climber I've become. The things that maybe I've lost um, in terms of technique are things that I'm not as good at as I used to be. And then mm -hmm. also things that I've gotten a lot better at and then figuring out how to just continue to balance myself out as a climber. But just having that awareness um, all along the process is really important and knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it. So. Now, do you think, are there things that when you go into the gym and um, or outdoors, and are there things that you specifically work on in terms of being dynamic anymore, or is, it, or is dynamic climbing just something that comes really naturally to you? Um, yeah, I, I work on, like, I guess coordination and, and power still in terms yeah. of like, I mean, I know Sky took 
a lot out of me in terms of catching a hold that was that small. Right. I've definitely not, I mean, it's a, basically a seven foot dyno to like, like one edge is like half pad to a full pad in cut. And the other <laughs> edge is like, I can't even comprehend quarter that. pad, barely in cut and you're double clutching to it. And it was, and it's a blind edge. You can't see it from when you jump. So right. you just, you see about a foot below it and it wraps around a bulge. So the whole thing was totally blind. Um, and that was, it was a really, really unique experience because I really hadn't, I had no, nothing to compare it to in my own climbing. I was like, I've never done a move like this. I've never completed something like this. So what, I don't know what this is going to take out of me or what, what this is going to be like even to stick it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, I guess it's just, I I still, I, I like to find things like that because they do push me to the next level in terms of my own climbing. I mean, theoretically, I'd like to be able to stick that thing one handed, you know, if I really wanted to, I wouldn't. I felt like if I could, if I had the strength to just catch it one armed, it would have been a lot easier of a climb for me than having to like line up the second hand. Right. Um, so that I see as a, the next progression for me is being able to jump that far to an in cut edge and just catch it one armed, you know? And so that, that would be theoretically would be the future of where I'd want to go with that. Um, and just knowing that that's out there or knowing that that could be a place to progress to is, is important understanding. Mm, just for everyone else's sake, because not everyone is as good at <laughs> dynamic climbing as you are, um, what are kind of the basic principles that you might um, tell a person in your clinic that they need to be focused on or thinking about if they want to really learn to be more dynamic? That's a really hard, because it, I think it just depends on the person. Everyone's a little bit different in terms sure. of what they're comfortable with. Um, but... I think like just kind of like emptying those structures from yourself and not feeling like you, it needs to be a certain way. Everyone's body is going to move a different way to something. Yep. Um, but I think initially it's like get the distance. So if you're trying to catch a hold, like don't worry about grabbing it. Don't worry about anything else. Just try and get the distance and get the right trajectory. Right. And then start thinking about how you're going to catch it. Yeah, and then and I think that trajectory is really important. The trajectory like we talked is huge. about your your path through space before. Yeah. I think a lot of people, and it's all the trajectory is right entirely based on where the feet are, mm-hmm. um, which foot's higher than the other, which foot's lower, um, what where you're pushing from first. Typically, you're pushing from a lower foot first, and then finishing with a higher foot, um, and and where those feet are going to push you when you jump. Um, right. A lot of times I've had to switch feet up. These feet feel perfect for getting the height, but they put me in a weird trajectory. So I'll switch the feet so that maybe I'm not quite getting as much height, but they put me on a much better trajectory to stick the holes. Right. Um, and if I can find a balance between the two so that I have a good trajectory as well as the good distance, then I'm putting myself in the right place to stick the hold. You know, I mean, you'll feel it. It's just all feeling really. You have to just start becoming aware of what your body's doing and whether or not that's going to be possible and um, yeah and you mentioned and you mentioned coordination yeah um, earlier as well and i think that's a really important aspect of particularly dynamic climbing because yeah. i think you have less time to to kind of be precise yeah um, do you ever just set problems that re- specifically require you more precision or more coordination yeah when i set at the spot i sat there for about 5 years um I definitely made sure that there were plenty of coordination based dinos Mm -hmm. in the gym, um, just to work on being coordinated. Um, and even moves that were just focused on being like really coordinated. And a lot of it is, um, especially with those coordination things is, um, you spend time practicing the move and and learning where the holds are and getting that muscle memory. Right. And then you almost have to start to like, not think at all anymore. You have to empty everything out of your brain and not be thinking about it. Cause I know that's what happened to me on sky is that, I would learn the move and I, I got the move like pretty dialed to where I was hitting the hold right. pretty well, but like just, just like hitting things a little off. And then I started really missing the hold a bunch. And then I realized like everything's there. My mind knows what it needs to do. Now I just need to quiet everything and not think about anything at all. Hmm. And that's what, what the process was is that I would get on the start holds and I would just settle myself completely and try and just not think at all and just literally just kind of like space out and just like let everything else do the work. So. Yeah, and when you say coordination based dinos, you're talking about like the World Cup style. Yeah, it usually involve. I mean, every dino requires coordination. Sure, but sure. The stuff that I was focused on was more double handed stuff that required yeah. you maybe to catch one hold in one direction, another hold in another direction. Um, just advanced coordination. Right. Um, everyone's gonna 
have a different level of coordination and they're going to have to start in their own way. I mean, even for some people just doing two hands at once, like one foot up is going to be coordination training for them. Yeah, you know, that's sure. going to be hard. Like that, that might not be comfortable for them. So that would be the starting point for them. And then finding holds maybe that are two jugs that are, you know, you know, a couple feet apart and then having to coordinate to stick those would be the next logical step up from that. Um, and then just making that more and more difficult as you go. Yeah. Um, good. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people get, uh, wrapped up in what they see the pros doing and think, yeah. Oh, I just need to jump directly into what they're doing and I'll be no, able to no. climb like them. Absolutely not. And I still like to do the really easy coordinations, like easier for me coordination stuff, just because it helps, you know, it helps with the basics. You still have right, to keep that foundation all strong. That. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's, that's always your starting point is focusing on big holds that require, you know, coordination that the movement may not be that hard. The dyno may not be that big, but you're just having to like learn how, how you stick things in certain, you know, orientations. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate you sitting down and talking to no me worries, about man. this. I'm definitely somebody who's going to take your advice and you know learning to be a more dynamic climber something i've struggled with and i've gotten better and better at and i know a lot of people are gonna yeah appreciate hearing what you have to say about it so, yeah absolutely yeah so and thanks, i mean man. if i can leave with anything it's just get a little wild with it you know you gotta like yeah. let the inhibitions go a little on the dyno so cool thank you no worries man thanks for having me yeah so i don't know about you guys but uh i got a lot out of that talk with carlo um you know it's really important to to have have open eyes when approaching something that's hard for you because uh you know the beta that's been used and uh, the beta that makes the most obvious sense may not be the way and i've also found it really important in my practice of climbing to to be able to learn a new skill and and continuously reevaluate when it is you should be using that skill and how to use that skill um so, yeah, practicing never really ends. Um, in fact, I think as you get stronger, you have to practice even more. Uh, so, yeah, see you guys in the next episode. Maybe. Power.